right. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's got a nice cup of positivity to drink this morning. I am here with the lovely Lindsay Parker this morning. Me and Lindsay met a couple times, and I feel like we've chatted more than we actually have chatted, which is wild. Um, but we live fairly close together, so we actually got to meet in person and have a coffee, which was supposed to be half an hour and turned into like an hour and a half. I don't know. It was really long. Um, but Lindsay's amazing, and she runs a coaching and facilitating program called, and I've forgotten the name, and I don't have it written down in front of me, <laughs> Connected Wisdom. That's right. You got oh, it. Cool. I got it right. Yeah. Connected Wisdom, which we're going to get into what Connected Wisdom is and all that interesting stuff. You also, because you live in the mountains, you spend a lot of time in nature and doing stuff like that. And coaching has sort of kind of driven you to probably bettering yourself a little bit, helping others. And we're going to talk a little bit about that first. But before we get into all of that stuff, I do want to touch base. So like whenever I think of Lindsay Parker, I'm <laughs> always thinking about your amazing pictures on LinkedIn because you always have nature in your pictures. And I was just wondering what the significance of that is. Yeah, I mean... I think first and foremost, I just take a lot of pictures, <laughs> I spend a lot of time outside. So um, it's actually been interesting because I had, I probably have 15,000 pictures on my iPhone, um, not all of which are nature, but it's, uh, they just sit there. So LinkedIn's become like an outlet for some of those, but it's been fascinating to see how people respond to, to the pictures because I get so many comments of like, wow, this place is amazing. And I'm, I'm often torn because I'm like, I literally just point a phone at something and it's, it's a great picture. Like I'm not, a, I'm not a trained photographer. I don't mm -hmm. think I do anything special. Um, but I think like, and I don't know that this is true, but I have this sense that when people see um, something in nature and they respond to it that way, it's like they're connecting with, with the power and the beauty of nature, which is like a mirror for themselves. Like, so in my mm. looks at a photograph and they're like, oh, this place is stunning. It's like, it's really a reflection of something in themselves that maybe they've lost sight of and, and want to reestablish that connection with. Um, I don't know that that's true, but it's certainly like when I put the photos out there now, it's something I hold of like, let's help people connect to that part of themselves again. Interesting. And do you think that has to do with the sort of raw kind of power that nature generally has on us, right? And it's been that's been centuries. It's kind of had this way to make us feel and affected our mood and our energies and stuff like that. And it's interesting that even through digital space, you're getting that kind of feedback from people, yeah. right? And that's just incredible, which kind of leads me to a question that is I was going to ask farther on, but let's dive into it now because I think it's really cool. Yeah. Um, so we obviously live in a very beautiful part of, of the world. Uh, for those of you who don't know, for those of you listening, um, we live right near the Rocky Mountains. Lindsay actually had the benefit of living right in the mm -hmm. middle of the Rockies. I have to look out my window and gaze at them from the distance. But we, I often spend a lot of time in them. So we live in this really cool kind of postcard space, right? We can, like you said, you can turn a corner and take a picture and it, people are like, wow, it's an amazing picture. But I do want to get into what if people don't live in that environment? What if they live in a city? If they live in a different environment? Like, what should those people kind of do? And how do they connect to nature? Yeah, and it's a, it's a great question. Because, you know, I, I was really reflecting on how fortunate I am that even when I lived, like I grew up in Vancouver, uh, well, in the suburbs, um, but there's lots of forests in BC, right? So even, um, even when I spent years in downtown, downtown Vancouver, um, we have Stanley Park, which is this like giant urban park. And you can literally, it's big enough that you can get into the forest and actually lose your sense of direction. <laughs> People wow. get lost in the park. Um, you know, I mean, they'll find their way out, but they have gotten lost in there. Uh, so I've always had that. Um, but you know, when I really think about like, what is it about nature? I think it's like, there's ways that even just with access to like literally a tree, a patch of grass, we can find that it may not be as powerful as sitting by the ocean or sitting amidst the mountains, but it's a little piece of it. And I think it's for me, like, how do you engage your senses with that thing? So that, you know, like, to how varying degrees of how comfortable you might be, like touch the bark of a tree, 
um, engage your sense in that, listen to the sound of its leaves in the wind and really like ground yourself in that energy of nature, even if it's just a little pocket, like if you've got a little bit of grass, like take your shoes off, walk mm. in the grass. Um, most urban centers do have park spaces, I think. That might be an overstatement. I mean, clearly I haven't been in every urban center. <laughs> um, so it's entirely possible that it's not like that. Most that I've been in have something. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really, it really is engaging as many of your senses as you can. And I think the biggest challenge in an urban center for me has been the noise factor. Because I think part of, Part of what I find particularly powerful about nature is stillness and silence and quiet. And it's not, I shouldn't say silence. It's a different kind of noise, right? Like it's a gentler, it's birds and wind and rivers sometimes or ocean. Um, whereas in the city, it can be really hard to tune out <laughs> traffic, sirens, those kinds of things. Um, so you really, you know, I think that's the piece of if you can find a small pocket of slight more quietness <laughs> that to me is is a really powerful thing yeah it's interesting that you say that so there's so many things i want to dissect in that but let's <laughs> let's talk first about um that stillness that you're talking about yeah. so actually really quick before we jump into that i do want to encourage anybody who's in the chat right now um first off good morning to you guys who are oh. jumping in if you are just getting in now totally understand by all means, please put in the chat what, how you guys interact with nature, because that would be an interesting thing to see as well. I know, like, for example, John's from Nigeria, so it'd be really interesting to see how you connect with nature in a different space, you know, a very different landscape than what we have. Or if you live urban, where do you go? How do you get into those parks? How do you have that? To go back to the stillness, I know... So my mom recently moved from a very small town um, mm -hmm. to a bit more of a busier center, also moved a lot closer to the noise of that busier center. And so she can go and still lives close to the forest, but the, like you said, there's still lots of noise, there's machinery, there's trains, there's helicopters. And she said that right away. She's like, I realized what I was missing is that still in the silence. So what she actually did is bought noise canceling headphones yeah. and then puts on like a nature, a nature track to listen to as she's walking in the, in the forest, even though, so just to drown out that noise, yeah. right? Because even though visually she was in nature, audio was telling her otherwise. So she was like, I need to change this, which is, I thought was brilliant. I was like, awesome way that's to go for that. So cool. yeah. yeah. And I was like, that's a powerful way to do that. Um, if you were having that, that struggle. Right. And yeah. then the other thing that I really loved that you said was like, you know, take your shoes off, right. Put your feet in the grass or the dirt or whatever. And also for myself, that whole, like touching the bark of a tree, I don't know what it is with nature when you connect to it, like physically like that whether it's bending down to put your hand directly on the ground mm -hmm. right or a tree or even just leaning back and like feeling the sturdiness of a tree I, wow. I find is so fascinating and i definitely find myself sitting in the nature sometimes and just sitting up against a tree putting my back against it and kind of just like you said listening to the leaves almost feeling the tree kind of move a little bit behind you as well right with the wind or whatever and that connectedness i think is is so powerful and I'm curious, I guess, what, why you think it's so powerful? What do you think draws us to that? You know, I think it's that we're actually, because, and you may have seen this in some of my posts, like we are made of the same stuff. Mm. Like we are, 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 I don't know, particles, atoms, whatever you want to call it. Like the, the energy is all the same. Um, and so I think there's a piece of it that's like, it allows us to get out of that headspace of like, I am this body and like very detached from it. And really to feel that sense that like, I am this ball of energy and this tree is energy. It seems solid. It seems, and it is to our sense of touch, but it's still energy. And when I lean against it, it's like, it's like when you hug a person, right? Like you feel something. Good um, metaphor. Yes. And like, that's what I sit with is, you know, if you've ever, if you've ever had an experience in nature where you've just been like blown away um, and found yourself maybe even emotional or just like super calm, that's what 
like, I think it's just like an energetic connection. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I was just going to say Shannon's got a lovely post yeah. here um, about, you know, he's from Australia, but every time he drives into the Rockies, he gets that emotional response. Right. Uh, so then he thought he had to, he had to move closer, I think, which is really, again, it's kind of, it's like, how do I get more of that? Right. How do I, and if it is, if you have the ability to completely change this, the space you're in, totally do it. Because yeah. what's interesting is I wanted to kind of segue into this a little bit is how does that help you with like, and this could be you or people you talk to or whatever. Um, how does that help you with kind of dealing with intense emotions that you're feeling or maybe help uplift you for the day? Like what does it do to your like emotional energy kind of having that, that yeah. connection? Well, for me personally, it's really um, like it's a regulation thing. Uh, it, it really calms my nervous system. Like to me, it's like, I'm just returning to my default state. So I'm conscious that when I get up in here, um, which happens to me a lot, uh, it's like, I'm, I'm not grounded. I'm, I lose my sense of calm. I lose my sense of peace and going out into nature again, is that energetic connection just brings everything down. Like mm. 10 me back to that state of like, right. There's just, there's nothing but calm um and it's like nature can be a mirror for that right and in the same way that like for an analogy's sake you know when you walk into a room and someone's like a ball of panic and stress and, and you like it you take it you, off you feel it right away right? Yeah. you're just like oh i don't want to be around this energy but if you walk into a room with a calm person you're just like oh. um and i think nature does that but nature doesn't have that freneticness to it like it's <laughs> it is a calming force so yeah mm -hmm. I think that's and that's my sense of what other people respond to as well is it just it it forces a bit of stillness um especially if you're really going into nature like without your device or maybe you have it like let's be honest I have my phone with me wherever I go in the woods and it's a safety you, got, you gotta take pictures right like how else pictures? you get your pictures <laughs> and you know if I trip and sprain an ankle I'd like to be able to call someone and tell them I'm gonna be late or whatever um but I don't <laughs> hold on wait wait I <laughs> <laughs> I, you just went, if I strip and sprain my ankle, I'm just going to tell somebody that I'm going to be late. Not, I want to be able to call for help. No, no, no. I just want to let them know that, hey, I, I have to drag myself out of the woods today. I might be a little bit late for our meeting. I, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't actually think search and rescue. Um, I talk about this with my partner all the time because it's like if I called him and I said I've sprained my ankle, he can't really do anything. Right? Yeah, like they just going to be like, suck it up, walk out. Um, which is the same if if I called search and rescue. I'm sure they'd be like, can you walk? Can you, yeah, hop right. <laughs> can you hobble out? And then do that. Yeah. Sorry so. to segue you there. Um, I just, that was too good. <laughs> it was a fair point. But yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's just like that little safety device. But I don't have to be on my phone. And I think when we detach from all of those things and we really like notice and really like pay attention to those subtle things. And, and again, like I come back to the same stuff, engage our senses. It, it just decompresses us. And my sense is that's really what people respond to when they're out in the woods as well. Yeah. Have you ever been disconnected from that for a long time? Like, have you ever had to, you know, whether it was going visiting friends in a city for like a week or whatever, have you ever had the, the polar opposite of that? And then oh, for sure. it, with that, like, what do you notice about yourself that changes when you, when you get that experience? You know, it's funny. I, I, I was in um, Calgary this week <laughs> for four hours uh, for a specialist appointment, like the small town doesn't have. Um, and I was just like, oh, like, I just felt myself getting into that tense state, like of shoulders up. And I just felt the need to rush. Um, that was the most recent example. And it was just a short window, but I could feel the like, it, it's just, it's not the space that I like to be in. Um, but certainly like, it's funny because people assume, I think I've always loved nature and really spend a ton of time in it. And I'd say it's been off and on. Like my parents always had us out in nature as kids, but then I think from the time that I stopped camping with my parents, when you just kind of get old enough that you don't have to go anymore. Um, I kind of, you know, didn't really 
do much intentionally with nature for probably like a decade. Wow. Um, and then I spent a couple years in grad school in South Carolina um, where I didn't have a vehicle. And so I felt very isolated on the campus. It's not where I was, was not what I would call a walkable city. Um, and so it's interesting because in hindsight, I'm like, oh, well, maybe that was part of the reason I, um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I, I wasn't particularly happy while there, but I think one of them might have been that I wasn't spending a lot of time outside um, and I wasn't, uh, I didn't really have access to real nature. It was like campus. <laughs> Synthetic, almost kind of man, yeah. man built, imitated yeah. nature. Yeah. And there weren't mm -hmm. even a lot of trees or grass on that particular campus. It was kind of like a concrete thing. Mm. So yeah, you know, I've gone through definite periods where um, either I've had access to nature and chosen not to engage with it in a really intentional way, uh, or I've been kind of away from it and detached from it. And I don't know that at the time I really noticed as much that the effect it was having, but certainly when I look back, I'm like, Ooh, yeah. You know, my life, is, my mood, my life, my way of looking at the world is very, very different when I'm intentional about it. I love that. Yeah, I'm very similar as well. I grew up, you know, living in, in the mountains oh, yeah. and even traveling. I don't live in Calgary now, which I'm very thankful for, although I do love the city itself. But I, I love the way that you describe that of feeling like you're kind of get that bunch in your shoulders, the hustle that you feel like you need to have for some reason, even though you're not in a hurry, yeah. you're like, Oh, I have to get to where I'm going. I have to do the thing I have to do. And it, this level of urgency sort of takes over your brain. And I know that even when I travel to other cities around the world, I get that same hustle feeling. And I usually get about two or three days in the city and I'm like, I need to, I need to leave now. I need to go to somewhere that's a lot slower down and, and a little more relaxing. Right. And what's interesting is I think that, we can get used to that. Like you said, it's hard to tell the difference of that when you're not being intentional with how you spend your time in nature or yeah. finding it even right. Calgary is a great example. There's lots of green space in Calgary. I know lots of, like you said, Vancouver has got Stanley park. There's a yeah. lot of space that you can go and be intentional inside of nature. Um, I mean, that's, that's a really powerful thing that it does affect your mood and it does, you know, you feel more elated when you're in nature and stuff like that. I know Jen mm -hmm. says she's moved closer to the woods instead of living in a, in a larger city, which is great. I love that. And then she does it. Yeah. She doesn't miss that, that constant noise and yeah. that simulation. Right. And it could probably be take people a bit of time to adjust to something that's maybe a bit more, you lose yeah. that hustle and bustle and that like, I know I've been to places that are like, I have that like loud stillness almost in a way. And it can be a bit unsettling at first, right? You're like, what's so quiet, especially if you're not yeah. used to it. Yeah. Um, but it is oh, it's wow. such a, such a powerful thing. How I do mean, you notice? Go, go ahead. I was just going to add to that. Like I, I have, cause I've lived in downtown downtowns. Right. Um, and I remember moving from um, downtown Vancouver to, well, a number of places when I left to go to Banff the first time, when I left to go to um, a small town in the Okanagan and the first couple of nights, it's almost the silence is jarring when you're not used to it. And my tendency used to be like, how do I fill that? Mm. <laughs> can I, um, you know, what can I put on? Like have a fan running, have a white noise machine. Cause it was almost like too uncomfortable to be in total silence. Um, so I think it, it is an adjustment even to come to a place um, like the mountains and to go off into the woods. And I see people who, um, you know, play everything from music to like murder podcasts <laughs> out loud on speakerphone as they walk through the woods. I'm like, that's out loud? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've heard music. I've heard people with speakers on, yeah. walking on hikes, which drives me nuts. So apologies if you're one of those people, but please stop because it ruins you. Yeah, not my personal But murder part. podcast? <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard more than one. And that would, those are the ones that I'm like, wow. Because if I let myself go down that path, I would probably start to imagine murderers in the woods, which would totally pull me out of my peace and tranquility. <laughs> um, and yet I've seen so many solo hikers just like you know with their murder narration going on <laughs> it's very um it's an interesting juxtaposition for sure yeah and now that actually interesting enough you 
obviously spend a lot of time in nature. Yeah. Um, you live in, you can go on hikes daily and stuff like that. And I do want to ask you, like, what do you notice about people that changes? I, I, maybe not when they're listening to music or, or murder mysteries, <laughs> but when they're really out there and experiencing nature, right? How do you notice people's energy change, their yeah. emotion change? What are the standout things that you see happen as you pull people out of the loud embrace of a city or a, yeah. um, urban environment into, into nature? It's like, it's one of my favorite things, like particularly in the summer, because in the winter, there's less people on the trails. <laughs> um, but in the summer, like, I love talking to people on the trails. That's one thing I love about hiking is that people say hi. Like, oh, I didn't ever thought of that. Everyone. Um Almost, I shouldn't say everyone says hi. I think 99% of the time, even if it's just a, hey, how's it going? But more often than not, there's little exchanges, right? Because sometimes you're passing someone or sometimes someone stopped to take a picture. And like, I love when people say things like, this is this is amazing, isn't it? And you can tell they're visiting. So sometimes I'll start to ask, like, oh, where are you visiting from? And how long are you here for? And we end up having these beautiful little, like they're just little snippets of connection. But there's something in it that's just so lovely that we're connecting over this shared appreci appreciation for the beauty that surrounds us. And you can see in their eyes, like, you know, when you see someone who's like, whoa, I am blown away by what I'm seeing. And I see that like daily in the summer. Wow. Just, you know, it can be out on a trail in the middle of nowhere, but it can just as easily be like we have a, a trail along the river in town that's super crowded, but you still see people stop and they're just like, whoa, there's a river running through downtown mm -hmm. and I can just walk along it and there's a waterfall and they're just like blown away by it. Um, and it's, it's just to see people's eyes light up. Like it gives me joy for one, but then so much hope for how we might start to take better care mm. of our surroundings our environment globally, even, um, even if someone's not from here, I think when you see and feel that power, you're like, Oh, maybe we need to be more thoughtful about protecting this place. Yeah. I never, I never thought about that, but yeah, I guess once you understand the power that it sort of has in a way, right. You begin to realize, Oh, hold on a second. Maybe this is more important than I realize it is. Right. And having that, that ability to go find a place of stillness and quiet is, um, yeah. is, is so vitally important. And then I didn't actually think I was going to chit chat about this, but as we've been talking, I'm really curious. We talked a lot about like kind of short term going on a day hike, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I am interested as you spend a long term thing. So recently, me and my wife, we started doing a lot more backpacking, two, three, four day backpacking trips. Mm -hmm. And it's like a, it's like the next level almost when you begin to be out of nature and away from a device. Maybe you have your phone to take pictures or whatever, but we usually have them on airplane mode just to save yeah. battery. Um, when you're away for that long and not just what happens to you, but what kind of spurred this thought for me was that connection to people you have. So you sit down at the t table at the yeah. end of your hike or whatever with the people and you're in this beautiful location and you chat with people and people are like more open. And like you said, they're a bit more smilier. I don't know if that's a word, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, sure. Um, but you can just chat with them, right? You have you. I guess you have the shared experience at that point in time as well that you can use to break the ice and talk about. So I found that really, really interesting. That it's it kind of exaggerates it as you spend more time in it, right? Oh. Mm -hmm. So for you, because like I don't, I don't backpack, right? Like I've never gone on a backpacking trip, and it's a hundred percent laziness of not wanting to. <laughs> like I'll put that out there. Um, but like, what do you, how do you feel different when you find yourself surrounded by people and you see them open up more? Like, what does that do for you? I think it just, it, it sort of, I'm a very transparent individual. Yeah. So it, it's neat to see other people embrace that level of mm -hmm. authenticity that you get when that happens, right? You don't, you've taken those people out of context at that point in time in a good way. You mm -hmm. don't know where they live right away you don't know what they do for work they're where you're kind of all dressed the same at, yeah. even at that point in time because you're all wearing outdoor stuff because you want to be comfortable and and lightweight or whatever mm -hmm. so you get people really just 
you get them. Yeah. And you don't get any of the other bits that you would generally see. Yeah. The, all our book covers look the same. So you have to kind of open each person's book to understand them. And I think that's what's really yeah. interesting about it is it levels the field almost in a way. And yeah. You, that's probably, if I were to sum it up, that's what it feels like to me. Yeah. That's so awesome. Like that, because I think, I mean, maybe there's an extent of that on a day hike, but like, I think like you're saying, there's a real different, um, like, equalizing force and you're really seeing because all that other stuff that we tend to talk about or we tend to look for in others like I think we intuitively know it doesn't really matter like what Mm -hmm. you do your job it doesn't matter um and that's not what real connection is it's not like oh you're a coach I'm a coach great we're both coaches Um, yeah what's talking about coaching (laughs) but it's not real um so there's something that's much more true about stripping away all that like stuff that we tend to fixate on and focusing in on the real stuff like why yeah we- the here and the now of everything yeah like what was your day like what did you see on the trail um it is like i think right now is a great way to put it it's like a presence piece mm-hmm. yeah take people out of context yeah i think that's and i think it's more so it's the fact of you don't experience that, you don't see it, but also mentally for yourself, you're not carrying that either, right? And it, it, this happens the longer that you're away from your regular life, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So when I used to guide people, I did multi-day trips. And some of the longest ones that we did were like four-day, five-day stuff. And you're really out there, you're in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's seen a screen in yeah. 36 hours. So you begin to lose, and I've seen this happen with people, they begin to sort of become disconnected in a good way from who they normally are and what they normally have to do and really become more of like their authentic, true self. And you start to see it come through themselves and they can't, they can't, for lack of a better way of putting it, they can't hide behind who they, what they do normally throughout the day. They have to be themselves. And it's such a beautiful thing to see that happen with people. So, and I do want to kind of with that, get into sort of what you do with connected wisdom because I find it really fascinating. So if you could just, I guess, break down what that means to you, that connected wisdom. And I think it's actually, it's interesting because I don't know that you'll, you anticipated this connection, but what you just said is really like that experience that people have when you take away all, not all the distractions, our mind can always be a distractor for us. Um, but when you take away a lot of the like really obvious ones, like TV, (laughs) phone, internet, all those things, the easy ones, the easy ones, (laughs) all of a sudden you're like left with nothing but you, um, and you start to look inward. That's where, like, that's where shifts happen for people, right? When you take away all that stuff that we usually numb ourselves with. Um, so connected wisdom for me is that return to that inner, inner knowing, Um, so I look at it as an alignment between our mind, our heart and our body. So learning to tap into each of those elements that they're not separate, but recognizing that any one of those can be an entry point to understanding who we truly are, um, and connecting with that more deeply so that we can show up without all those masks, without all those distractions from a place of, Like, and I don't know if you've experienced this, so it's a good question. Like, have you Mm -hmm. had moments where you've just been so certain and you don't know where that certainty comes from? And I don't mean certain in something external happening, but just like, this is, this is me and it's still and quiet. Yeah. I've definitely had those moments. Oddly enough, I'm trying to think if I've had them. I have had them in nature. Okay, yeah. It's interesting because I've had them not in nature as well. The most recently was, was not in nature because I haven't been as um, dedicated to spending time in the nature. Um, so I guess two moments I'll, I'll touch on then. The first one, which was nature-focused, was um, I was doing an overnight trip with just some friends and a ra- on a rafting trip. Nothing wild. Pretty tame stuff. Um, and we were just pulled over to the side of the, side of the river so somebody could use the bathroom. And I, it's very vivid in my brain. I remember this. And I was sitting there in in the raft, and one person was off going to the bathroom. And beautiful view. We were down um, the Kootenai River, just down Highway 97. 
and this majestic beautiful mountains all around Mm -hmm. us and you can hear the water lapping gently on the side of the boat and it was super still super calm and i just remember going this is why i get out here and do this kind of stuff is Mm -hmm. for this just moment in feeling that cemented i need to do this for my own inner good but also i had friends with me who had never done that experience before and you could see them just soaking that in nobody needed to talk we didn't have to say anything because we were all just in this beautiful moment Mm. of just wow this is what we're doing right now yeah so that was really interesting and then more i guess i had another moment that was really kind of in the right place feeling was Mm -hmm. when um i don't think bamf doing a speaking arrangement just before i talked to you actually and i got a message from i was just about to stand up to speak and i got a message from a close friend of mine that said hey thanks for all the stuff that you do with your newsletter and, and stuff like that it really helps me and that cemented that for me. And that was mm-hmm. really kind of almost felt like something dropping into place. And yeah. Going, this is what I need to be doing. And I need to be spreading this positivity and helping people find the actionable things to do. Yeah. Um, and it is, it's really an interesting sort of key drop in almost in a way, right? We are like, okay, yeah, there it is. And it clicks. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And like, Cause I imagine when that happens or I, I, at least when I experience what I consider my moments of just like total clarity is like all that noise goes away mm-hmm. and there's just like a nice sense of like, it's like that sigh that you let out where you're just like, it's not a sad sigh. Right. Like uh, <laughs> I always, um, I like to make it's that. Like a, it's a relief. Yeah. It's like a contentedness mm-hmm. of just total, like I'm accepting, like this is, acceptance of me acceptance of this moment and it's just it it just is like I'm not thinking about past I'm not thinking about future um and that's like to the extent to which we can remind ourselves that that's actually like connected wisdom for me is how do we help people understand or how do I work with people to understand that's actually that's you um that's your natural state and we talk a lot about default states in a way that I think is not actually our default state, right? Like our default state is to be stressed by external things and to see threat. Um, Our default state is to experience fear um, when the unknown comes. And I have been sitting with um, this belief of, or this question of, well, how are those beliefs serving us? And if we're really grounded in a sense of self, are we defaulting to fear Um, Or do we actually move with ease and more gentleness through the world? So that's a lot of the work that I do is helping people really pay attention to two things. Like what are, what are the stories that we're living with that we have maybe not questioned Um, and some call those beliefs. And so it's, you know, those words are maybe interchangeable. And then how do I, access something deeper than those stories and lean in to wherever is a natural starting point. Cause like, I think the challenge with a lot of inner work is that there's a lot of like, Oh, you should do it this way. And I'm like, I don't know. I can't tell you how (laughs) Um, I know how I started, but I think there's entry points that can be in the heart entry points that can be through the mind entry points that can be through the body, but all of it's the same. So it's just for me thinking about um, how do I work with someone to understand where they can go to the most easily so that they can build on that and deepen their sense of self. That's amazing. What do you, so it's amazing that you probably guide people and help people through that. I don't know if you've guided even the right word. Um, No. I I was like, I was like, I don't know if I like that word actually for it. So that wasn't like, I'm not, yeah. Like, I think it's a hard thing. Yeah, Um, it is a hard thing. What do you think is something that, people can sort of start doing even just themselves at home, maybe after they listen to this, that they can do to sort of help themselves start making that connection to that, that inner wisdom or connected wisdom that you talk about. Yeah. And I, I really do come back to stillness more often than not. Um, So I think interesting things happen if you ever, and I've done this with myself, I've just challenged myself to sit in total silence. Um, with my eyes closed, because I find if my eyes are open, like I just look at things and then I the mind starts going, right? 
for even to start with like one minute. And just to notice like what actually comes up for you without judgment, without trying to change it, just starting to pay attention to the degree of discomfort that might exist there and what you might be trying to bring in to fill that space. Mm. So very Um, meditative in a way. Yeah. But like really more, well, I guess almost not because meditation is about well, it's about embracing that stillness, I guess, in a way. Yeah. But you're talking more of like paying attention to what comes into that space yeah. and dissecting it in a way. Yeah. Like for me, it's always interesting to start. Like I spend a lot of time with people in noticing. Um, and it's interesting because uh, the the coaching, um, what, I, what I find often happens is people come into coaching with a predisposition towards action. Right. And I don't, I don't, I'm not saying action is a bad thing. Um, And I will say that we sometimes have a tendency to move to action without understanding. So I am a big fan of like, take a step back and just start to notice all these things that are happening under the surface so that you can learn from them. Um, And so you can see what your patterns look like, how the ego manifests for you. Um, And then then we can move into action. Then we can move into, um, you know, sometimes shifts. The interesting thing is that sometimes just by noticing, we can let go of things. And we don't actually have to consciously do something different. Like, I think we spend a lot of time talking about like, oh, I need to replace this quote, bad habit with a quote, good habit. Um, and I'm not saying there's not a place for that sometimes. Uh, and Sometimes just by noticing like, oh, here's a pattern that I have, it loses its power. Oh, because like, you've given it like it's like thought in a way. Yeah. When you've, you've, I think some of the reasons some patterns um, continue to persist is like we don't even want to look at them. So there's shame attached to it. There's judgment attached to it. And the second we shine a light on some of those things, it's like um, there's a great – it's used in many books, but like they often – writers will use the metaphor of like when you're a kid and you have a nightmare and you're afraid of monsters in the dark, what do your parents do? They come in, they turn the light on. They're like, Hey, look, no monsters under your bed. Uh, And then we're like, cool. We go back to sleep. We don't think about it again. Um, And, and it may not happen that quickly with longstanding patterns, but there is something about shining the light on it and seeing like, Oh, that's, that's interesting. Wow. That's such a good way of putting it. That was beautifully. Yeah. That's that, you know, that metaphor was now. crazy powerful. <laughs> I'm telling <Man>, you. <laughs> you, for, you, you floored me a little bit. That was really good. Um, do you think, so obviously when people like, I like that you said, just do it for a minute or whatever like that, because, and you mentioned as well, it is something that people are going to feel uncomfortable doing right away. Mm-hmm. it's that being like, Oh, I need to pay attention to myself and listen to my inner self, um, a bit more, but you know, is it something that will get easier with practice as people do it as become more comfortable with that feeling of doing that? And what kind of begins to change as you become more comfortable with it? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so I, I don't know. I don't hold that. Or maybe I'll make a distinction, which I don't actually know that you were trying to make, like, because it's not about, um, for me, like, stopping the thoughts or um, trying to find, like, I don't, I don't even aim to find a quiet mind anymore. Um, It's more about not attaching to things. So I think the more that we get in the habit of noticing, um, like you can do this beautiful thing about kind of like mindfulness or whatever you want to call it is like, I can be washing dishes. And if my focus is on washing dishes, I can use it as a way to understand where does my mind go sometimes? What do I not pay attention to? What do I pay attention to? And I can start to notice those habitual things where, you know, you start washing a dish and then you think about, oh, what do I need to do for dinner tonight? Or, you know, what do I need to get ready for tomorrow? And then you're not doing, you're not in the present anymore. You pulled yourself right out of it. And to me, the the art is just noticing that. It's not trying to stop it as much as just being aware of like, oh, hey, I wandered off in my brain and I can always pull myself back. Um, Cause that's, 
like where I am, what I have been really working on in my life and what I, what most of my client work boils down to is how do we become more um, aware of our ego and when its little voice starts chirping and just redirect. And it sounds Mm -hmm. like, well, that sounds lovely to be able to do that. But we, (laughs) we tend to tell ourselves their stories of like, well, that voice is so powerful. Like I can't control my mind from going there. And while maybe your mind will go there, what I would say is, what what value is it believing that you can't pull it back? Mm. So that mindfulness practice of like noticing where your mind goes and bringing it back to the present is just the same thing that you'll be doing if you notice like, oh, my ego is telling me I'm not good enough um, or my ego is telling me that I'm not capable of this is I can say, oh, that's the ego talking. Let me pull myself back. And what do you notice is the like the benefit of starting to do that is of being more present and being more aware of, of your own internal thoughts and stuff like that. What are some of the benefits that come out of that? The biggest thing that for, for me personally is so like, it's funny because actually just yesterday and Sandra's on the call today. So hi, Sandra. Um, <laughs> she said uh, in one of her comments to me that I'm so Zen um, and I had a good chuckle to myself because I um, have, if you ask my parents, if you ask my brother, if you ask even my partner, like, is Lindsay Zen, especially two, three, four, five years ago, they'd be like, that <laughs> is not the word we would use <laughs> by a long shot. So for me, though, the, the shift has been like less reactivity. So I have been a highly reactive person to everything. Every little thing that someone would say to me, I might either blow up into something huge or I'd react to with a ton of anger or frustration or hurt. And being more present has allowed me to let go of some of those attachments to things. Um, and not always instantly, like I posted the other day about this week, you know, I had a a small scenario occur that like hooked my ego and I went with it and I spent days kind of like not constantly thinking about it, but kind of coming back to it with a lot of, um, annoyance. But I promise you that five years ago, I would have a responded to that person's post right away. Um, super passively aggressively and then (laughs) probably would have spent two weeks like being self-righteous about it on the internet. So there's, you know, (laughs) it's not about, again, for me, it's not like, how do I stop that always forever? It's how do I become more aware of it? How do I lessen my reactivity? And that's been the big thing for me. Um, And that opens up a lot more space uh, for, you know, like, Responding to things from the heart instead of mm. the That's a good line. I like that. Responding to things from the heart instead of from the ego. That's cool. And I guess getting yourself to that ability to, like you said, be less reactive gives you the ability to do that, to yeah. not be sort of um, reactive and immediately jumping on something in that sense of just sheer, mm. like, maybe not a good emotion to use, right? Your negative emotion, your anger or something like that, instead of being like, okay, I'm going to settle down and, and come from a place of more understanding. Do you think that that shift in yourself, because you said four or five years ago, you were a different kind of individual. How much of that has come from helping others through the coaching process as well? Like, do you mm-hmm. find a lot about it for yourself during, during that? I do now. Um, so I was very fortunate that, and I'm trying to like, I don't actually remember how many years ago it was now, but I, in the process of creating a program with an old boss of mine, like she introduced me to this gentleman who does, I don't even know what to describe um, or how to describe what he does, but I ended up working with him and had like a super instant transformational experience that really was like the kickstart to my whole process. And I've I've still had to stay in the work and in the practice for the last four years. Cause at first I thought, Oh, I'm, I'm healed. I'm fixed. That's uh, it. I'm, done. <laughs> I'm done. I don't have to do anything. Uh, and then of course, like three months later, I crashed and burned and had this massive, like, you know, they call it a dark night of the soul where I felt like my world was falling apart. And 
I had lost the magic <laughs> that this person, I, at the time I thought, well, he gave me this magic. So now I have to keep going back. Mm -hmm. um, and then I learned, oh no, like that was just, that was there. And my work is how do I tap into that when I need to? Um, and more consistently. And so now when I work with clients, like I'm coming from a really different place than I used to. Cause like when I first started coaching, and I think I said this to you when we met, like I wasn't coaching. Um, you were just listening. I wasn't even listening. Um, <laughs> or I was half listening. Like I'll be honest, right? Like, and I'm talking 15 years ago in the corporate mm. environment. Like I was like, let me show you how I can fix your problem. Um, you were, you were like just grabbing hands and pulling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of advice giving a lot of, um, in my head being very right. And that obviously shifted over, you know, a decade into a place of more like I am actually listening, but still from the place of like, I'm here to solve with you. Um, so I'm not solving for you, but I'm solving with you. And now I come from a place of like, I'm creating space. That's such a good way to put it. And I learn, like, as you create space for people, like, they step into it. And they have, like, I had a coaching client I wrapped up with um, earlier this, this summer. And, you know, she started in one of our conversations being like, oh, you've done this and you've done this for me. And I'm like, hold on, because you, like, every insight that she had came from her talking and then finding her way to something where she would pause and be like, that's it. And half the time I wasn't even asking a question at that point. She just meandered her way to an answer. And what I learned from my clients is like, that's it. Is that if you give people space, if they give themselves space, they will find their way and they will light up mm -hmm. and you can see it in people's eyes. Like that same thing I describe with people on a hiking trail when they look at nature and they're like, bam, I have watched people go from like, you know, when I say dull eyes, like, you know, when people yeah. have like a sadness in their eyes to like lit up eyes. And that's when I'm just like, wow, that's in all of us. So for me, every coaching client is a reminder of like within every one of us is this like light in our eyes. <laughs> And this light in our souls that's dying to get out if we just give ourselves space. And sometimes people need someone else to give us that space. So does that go back to, because with Connected Wisdom, you talked about this thing called the real you. Is yeah. that kind of what that is, that bringing that, that real you out? Yeah. And I think, because it's like, again, like I, I'm stealing from spiritual teachers, right? Like this isn't like Lindsay stuff. Um, is that we're finding our way home mm -hmm. mm. and I'll say most of us, cause like myself included, most people I've interacted with in life have developed masks or deeply ingrained patterns that um, are kind of, they're trying to fill a void of, you know, not feeling worthwhile, not feeling good enough, not feeling accepted, but none of that is you. Like the light of the soul is there and constant underneath everything always, or at least that's like, that's a Lindsay belief. And I, I hold that to be true. Um, and so, yeah, I, a lot of the work with a client or with myself every day is like, how do I find my way back to that and strip away all the crap <laughs> that I've piled on top of me uh, and kind of suppressed, right? Like it's, you know, if you tease a, backpacking analogy right like imagine the weight that you're carrying it's like taking off your backpack at the end of a three-day thing and you're like wow i'm light i can jump now <laughs> i don't have yeah. this 50 pounds of dead weight on my back anymore it's amazing that you just used the backpack analogy in one of my first meetings i talked with uh, a lovely gentleman in the name of keenan hart mm -hmm. and he used a very similar analogy with the backpack and he talked about how we acquire the backpack of mm -hmm. how we, we feel this need to have this backpack of stuff that we carry around. And as we walk around, we gather more stuff to, to put in our backpack so we can show people, Hey, look at all this cool stuff in my backpack. And it's so neat that now here I am talking to you about 
how to take off of that, that backpack now, yeah. how to let that stuff go, how to be like, you know what? I don't need all this crap. I, you know what I mean? And I'm, it doesn't need to be physical crap. It can be emotional as well. Absolutely. Right. And it's like, how do I drop this bag of emotional stuff that I'm just carrying around for some reason? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's cool that it's kind of come, come full circle like that, that yeah. um, you help people sort of, remove their backpacks so to speak, or give them the space anyways, maybe the rock yeah. to sit on to take the backpack off, right? To lean into yeah. the metaphor. Yeah. What do you notice has changed about you over the last, you know, we talked a little bit about it um, yeah. over the last kind of 15 years or so you said you've been coaching. What are some of the biggest changes that you can see about yourself from, from then to kind of who you are now? <sighs> yeah. I mean, it's a, I, I think, truthfully, 15 years ago, um, if you can imagine um, the petulant six-year-old version of Lindsay having a <laughs> tantrum was always either just under the surface or sometimes on the surface. Um, and that little petulant self is still sometimes <laughs> crops up now. Um, but she's, there's two things. One, I used to think that was just me. Like, I'm just volatile. <laughs> um, I love drama. Yeah. I love to. I, I have a short fuse. It's just the way that I am. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the big, maybe that's actually it. So I'm, I'm coming to an answer as I talk to you here. It's like, I think I used to sit with this idea that there was this, this is who I am. Um, and while I still think there is a, this is who I am. And it's now like a strip back, like, and it's not who I am. It's who we all are. Mm. And who we all are, are these gentle, peaceful, loving souls. That's it. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I feel better already. Oh um, <laughs> That's wow. I feel like there's a reason, um, and I, I mean, there's a lot of people who dismiss, um, they don't want to talk about soul period. Um, or, you know, when you start talking about like at our base, we're all loved. Like I, I get a lot of eye rolls and I'm, I'm okay with it. Like I'm genuinely okay with it because I used to do that. If you came to me and be like, Lindsay, you can love every person equally, regardless of what they do. You'd be like, Freeman, you are out to lunch. <sighs> Um, I might not say it to your face, but I go gossip about you behind your back. You're like, like I'm definitely thinking it. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so like, I, I think we all may or may not get to that same place. And I'm not here to tell people you need to get to that place. Um, but I do think when it sometimes when something strikes you, like I've said to clients before, just the simple phrase of like, that is not who you are. And I have watched like shoulders drop and tears mm. start flow. And I'm like, something's hitting. There's a part of you that knows that's true. And I think when you get to that place, then like, that's where your, you know, your magic, if you want to call it, that starts to happen for you. And I think my job is like, how do I, how can I more often, not just through being a coach, but like as a human being, how can I more often create those moments where people feel seen and people like feel that sense of like, I just feel good. I feel like we've almost come full circle because what you're describing really sounds like a lot of what we talked about when you get into that space in nature. So mm -hmm. and now I'm just sort of a, jumping to an assumption here, but it, it sounds like what you're trying to do is help people get to that sort of the same experience that you would get if you were on top of a mountain or walking up one, so to speak. And that like moment of stillness and realization that you get when you're, when you're in nature, but to get them to do that in their own brain and in their own mind to have that, like, yeah. ah, okay. Like this is what it feels like the shoulder, like you were saying in an urban center, you feel like you're tensing up and stuff like that. Yeah. And when you go into nature, that drops. So the, again, I, it's physical, right? Yeah. Those shoulders drop. So it's, I think it's really neat that there's, is that level of connection there, that mental mm -hmm. stillness that we can get. Um, well, yeah, because as much as I, like, I mean, for me, nature is a truly spiritual experience. Like I, I am sometimes completely overwhelmed <laughs> when I look out like from a mountaintop and that's, 
but I don't believe that you need to have that mm. to have a spiritual experience or to connect with yourself. Um, it's powerful for me and I am equally, you know, sure that I could drop someone else on the top of a mountain. They'd be like, that's nice. It's cool. Um, yeah. But it might not be like a revelation for them. So I don't think you need nature to spark that sense Completely. of wonder and that sense of connection with self. But I know for me, it's like, it is like a bit of a battery recharge. <laughs> yeah. I just plug into nature. It, it is something that reminds me that I am not just this physical body. I am a part of something much larger. Yeah, I think it's really important that people learn to find that as well. That I love the way that you put that, that finding the thing for you, it's nature that helps you recharge your battery, finding the thing that helps them recharge their battery in a, in a very true and, you know, kind of down to earth way. Um, mm -hmm. So it's neat for you that it's, it's plugging into nature. Maybe for some people it's reading a powerful book. Maybe it's doing meditation, yeah. yoga, a yoga class, right? Yeah. So it's cool that, part of maybe what you do is helping people sort of find that thing that they need to do as well to recharge the battery, reset, you know, kind of let some stuff go. It's really, really fascinating. Um, and I got to commend you for doing it and helping people in that way, because it's, I think it's something really important, especially as we get into busier and busier times as a society, we tend to move very fast. We tend to be distracted by things all the time. So helping people find that ability to find the stillness and calm in their own mind is a phenomenal work. So hats off to you for, for taking on that challenge. It's really cool. What do you notice? How do you, when you, you described seeing people find that moment and the light come back on in the eyes and the shoulders kind of drop again, how do you feel when that happens? You know, it's, it's probably, it's like a shared sense of, I don't know the word, like I'm really struggling to find a word, but like, I just feel like with them. Mm. Like I really feel, cause I think I see myself in, in that experience and yeah, there's just something like anytime you see someone light up, like it's a, a, a simplistic level. It's the same. Like if you ever watch a child open a gift and they get super excited and you see <laughs> that light, like that's maybe more surface level, but there's like this, this joy that when you see it, you can't help but feel it at a really deep level. And that's kind of like, I think I just feel supremely connected with those people in that moment. Yeah. That's really interesting. So I just read the other day, um, about mirror, oh, this is hard to say. I hate this word. Mirror neurons, Oof, putting those two words together. Oh, yeah. Well, right. Yeah. And that's part of it, right? The fact that when somebody, um, feels something and you get this through a digital space, even yeah. we have neurons in our own brains that light up in re response to that. It's why we yawn when people yawn. It's why we mm -hmm. smile when people smile at us because our brains are reacting to that. So it's interesting that even on such a spiritually deep level you get that still as well you get that kind of mm -hmm. reflection almost happening which is so so fascinating and part of the reason why i'm such a big advocate on people helping others right because it does in a way completely makes you feel a certain way and that's not maybe why we do it obviously but it is a neat kind of reciprocating factor that you get yeah. an added bonus so to speak of, yeah. of helping people, right. Is an own little uplifting of yourself as well, which is yeah. obviously not why we do it. <laughs> I want to be very clear here, but it certainly is an interesting byproduct. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's, it's, that's such an interesting, I don't know if you've seen that friends episode where, um, I don't know if you watched friends, but Phoebe's trying to find like big the friend. one elf unselfish act. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and she just like, she almost loses her mind because she wants to prove to Joey that there's a purely, unselfish act out there um, where she would get absolutely nothing in return and in fact could cause herself pain to benefit another person and she can't find that thing um so anyways it's well yeah i mean it is tough right because okay. regardless of what you're doing yeah i think that we as humans have a natural feeling of good when we do good right? and i think 
Yeah, like, I, but that's not a bad thing. I was just about to say that, so I'm glad that you did. Yeah, exactly. We don't need to shun that. It's fine. I think there's a difference between wanting to get versus just feeling good, having helped. Like, in my mind, it's like, if I help you, but it's because I want something from you in return, um, my motives that's not coming from, from, I don't believe at least a true place of love. Um, whereas if I help you, but then I feel like, Oh, that was heartwarming. I gave you a hand and I made your day better. Um, but I want nothing in return from you. It's a very subtle difference, isn't it? Yeah. That I'm helping you because I want something versus I'm just helping you. And then I get something. Yes. It's so it's, it's, it almost feels like it's the same, but it's really not right. It's very, and it's a very subtle, important difference. And we've normalized a lot of giving to get in this. Way. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I'll scratch your back. You scratch mine. Um, like the fact that there's an expression for that. <laughs> I would say that probably says something pretty big about it, right? Yeah. And it's like, oh, that's, that's the reason. Um, I think some of us, that's the only reason that we do help others. Um, but I like to think that if we really connect with our heart and really notice like, oh, wow, like helping another person, it's a connection. It's um, and it's beyond like the surface level. There's something about seeing an opportunity to be there for a fellow human that is really beautiful. Mm. And if we come from that place, like, yeah. Stunning. Wow. I feel like we could talk about this kind of stuff for a really long time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I am aware of the time, so I, I do want to be yeah. uh, cognizant of, of your time and, and everybody that, that might be listening as well or watching. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to wrap up, but I feel like we might need to, and maybe we'll have to have you on again to, uh, to dive into some other stuff. But before we wrap up completely, there are a couple other questions I want to kind of let you know about. And feel free, you can answer these fairly kind of rapid fire, yeah. um, just quick questions. So what are three things that you do every day to help yourself live a more positive, joyous, and maybe more still, still life. Okay. Um, so one thing I do, uh, twice a day, every day is like, it's an energy practice that I do where I like ground myself in, it comes from the work I did with that one gentleman. So it's a very specific process, but I do that twice a day. Um, I do readings every morning now, um, readings with written reflection. Um, and then I hug my cats. Oh, <laughs> that's amazing so you ground yourself twice yeah. a day you do is it, you said morning readings morning readings with written morning readings yeah. yeah yeah and for lack of a better way of putting it you hold those that you love closely <laughs> here i also hug my partner my, <laughs> but yes um the cat but yes the cats the cats just furrier and cuddlier yeah. <laughs> cool and then the next three are what are the three most important things that you think um revolve around positivity what are the most important three things people have to do to live a more positive life mm, um giving like we were just talking about um i use the word appreciation i feel like it's less stressful than gratitude because there's always things like i can appreciate the look of sun on snow um but i may not feel compelled to like thank the universe but it's still <laughs> Uh, and I think, I think you've got to look for pockets of joy. Like, I don't even feel like I have to look for pockets, but I think joy is everywhere. Um, but I think if you're struggling with positivity or struggling to find good in the world is like actively seeking out, you know, dogs playing in snow, um, old couples holding hands, uh, like whatever it is that makes you smile is to seek those things out. Mm, I love that. Give freely. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> let me add that little, little yeah. uh, nuance in there. And I love that you said appreciation, find appreciation for things because it does feel a little less heavy than gratitude. A lot of people are like, holy crap, that's a big word. Or appreciation just feels like, yeah, I can appreciate that. So I love that. So give freely, appreciate the little things or find things to appreciate in life and then find those little pockets of joy and, and seek those out. Love those really powerful things. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for making the time to come on and chit chat with chit, yeah, chit chat with me this morning. Really, I can't get any words out today. Um, I really appreciated the chit chat. I love yeah. this conversation. We definitely didn't go to all the areas I thought we would, but some areas that I think are really important. Yeah. And I hope that people listening, you know, got some insight, got some actionable things. 
um, f- help finding yourself, you know, take those minutes in your day to close your eyes, feel that stillness, I think is really important. So thanks so much, Lindsay. And Thank uh, thanks so much, everybody watching. And thanks, everyone. Yeah, it's so great to see um, some familiar names here. Yes, right? You're like, I know these people. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, guys. And make sure you tune in uh, two weeks from now on another Saturday, um, right before Christmas, actually. Where I'm I was going to say that's Christmas fun. Eve. It's, it is Christmas Eve, yeah. 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 So it's going to be a special holiday-themed uh, cup of positivity on the next one. So thanks so much, guys. Bye, much everyone. love. And make sure to go find a reason to smile today. <laughs>